I would also like to uh, join previous speakers in thanking uh, Peter Wood for organizing this. Um, I want you to cast your mind back to the middle of the 19th century when a small American fleet entered Tokyo Harbor, led by Commodore Perry, and forced the opening of Japan. Uh, in reaction to this action of the United States, the Japanese not only opened up economically, they sent the crown prince uh, with a group of civil servants to do a tour of European capitals because among other things, they were interested in seeking potential allies against the United States, which had forced to them to open up. And the story is told, I'm not quite sure whether the story is true, I once tried to look into this and got nowhere. The story is told that there's an exchange in Britain between a British civil servant and the Japanese, uh, his Japanese counterpart. And the British civil servant asked uh, the Japanese civil servant, uh, what were you sent to find out? What were your instructions? Uh, and th the exchange got complicated because the Japanese civil servant wasn't quite certain what was being asked, but the British civil servant said, look, we sent an embassy to Japan at the same time we invited, or, or, or you sent this embassy here, uh, and we instructed them to find out about your defenses, about inland waterways, about your economy, what you produce that we might buy, what you don't produce that we might sell to you, and so forth. The Japanese civil servant replied, ah, I understand now. He said, we were really asked only one question. What do they bow down to? What do they bow down to? Um, I begin with that because it strikes me that it's worth asking at the beginning, what is it that distinguishes the West? What is it that we bow down to or aspire to? What is it that we look up to? And when did it emerge? Um, let me make a suggestion that we are distinguished from prior civilizations and from more distant civilizations by an embrace of what Leibniz uh, in the late 17th century, early 18th century called the principle of reason's sufficiency. Now, what I mean by that is the conviction, or at least the suspicion, that there's a kinship or a fit between the human mind and the world in which we live. I say suspicion because we're never quite sure that this is true, uh, and it's open to challenge. But there's a presumption upon which the Western project is built, and it's the presumption of the principle reflected in the principle of reason's sufficiency. And it seems to me it first becomes visible in ancient Greece, not in theory, but in practice. Uh, after the Mycenaean period, in the course of the Dark Ages, at the very beginning of the Archaic period, what you have is the emergence of the polis in ancient Greece, and it is characterized by a practice. The practice of making political decisions by holding a council and having discussion, and then by holding an assembly to consider the agenda set by that council in which there will once again be discussion. In other words, the presumption upon which it is based is that logos, rational speech, if deployed in uh, public deliberation, is likely to lead to better decisions than rolling the dice or consulting the entrails uh, or bowing down to someone who claims to be God's representative on earth. In other words, it is the presumption that rational speech is probably the best way to cope with the human world, the political world. In my view, that attitude built upon practices 250 years before Aristotle says man is a political animal, 250 years before Aristotle says it is logos that distinguishes human beings from the animals and makes man a political animal, already they're living a life built upon that principle which has not yet fully been articulated theoretically. It seems to me that there's a kind of drift of that principle to the next stage, which is the conviction 
that the natural world is also amenable to understanding on the basis of logos, of rational speech, and on the basis of public rational speech in which there is exchange between people going back and forth, arguing about it. Logos also means argument. Um, when Thales of Miletus, Anaximenes and Anaximander found philosophy in the sixth century BC, what they're doing is taking Greek political practice and transferring it to the natural world. And you can see this even in the language used. Uh, the word that gets used for a universe that can be apprehended as rational is the word cosmos. But the original meaning of cosmos is political. If you look at Homer and you look at the, the, the catalog of ships, it is a cosmator that calls them out in the proper order and puts them in their place. If you look at Greek politics and you turn to the island of Crete where we first have evidence for the existence of a constitution and of annual magistrates, those magistrates are cosmoi. In other words, the political cosmos precedes intellectually the natural cosmos. Uh, and you can see just how powerful uh, this notion is uh, that, that gets carried over into the foundation of philosophy because it's also connected with another doctrine. Uh, Aristotle tells us in the physics that the early philosophers, Thales, Anaximenes, Anaximander, were all monotheists, which is a remarkable thing because the culture is not monotheist. Homer and Hesiod are polytheists, and most Greeks are polytheists. We do not have much in the way of writings of Thales, Anaximenes, and Aximander, but we do have Xenophanes. And let me read something to you, because it seems to me you put it all together, and this is a statement of what the West is about. Here's what he says. One God there is, greatest among gods and men, in no way like mortal creatures, either in bodily form or in thought of his mind. The whole of him sees, the whole of him thinks, the whole of him hears. Here comes the kicker. He stays always motionless in the same place. It is not fitting that he should move about now this way, now that. But effort, effortlessly he wields all things by the thought of his mind. Now note this. This is a God limited by logos. He doesn't do that which is not fitting. He conforms to reason. Then he goes on and he says, but mortal men imagine that the gods are begotten, that's a reference to Hesiod, and that they have human dress and speech and shape. If oxen or horses or lions had hands to draw with and make works of art as men do, then horses would draw the forms of gods like horses, oxen like oxen, and they would make their gods' bodies similar to the bodily shape that they themselves each had. The Ethiopians say that their gods are snub-nosed and black-skinned. The Thracians, that they are blue-eyed and red-headed. Think about that. It's the first rejection of ethnocentrism. The first identification of ethnocentrism as what it is, and the first rejection of it in the name of a reason that is universal. Homer and Hesiod, he says, coming closer to home, have attributed to the gods everything which brings shame and reproach among men, theft, adultery, and fraud. Now, monotheism, think about that. This is in the wake of the time of Deutero-Isaiah and the Babylonian captivity. And the clearest statement of Hebraic monotheism comes in the second part of Isaiah, maybe the first clear statement of Hebraic monotheism. So it's the same age. Thales of Miletus is said by uh, Herodotus to be Phoenikos, a Phoenician, which means he speaks Aramaic and comes from that area. I've often wondered whether Thales wasn't a bad Jew like Spinoza and that the God of the philosophers wasn't a kind of echo of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Leave that aside, however. Leave that aside. There are passages in the Jewish Bible that would suggest a kind of rejection of anything like philosophy. I refer you to chapters 28 and 38 of the book of Job. Who are you to question me, God says. Who are you? Where were you when I laid down the world as it is? 
What is wisdom? It is fear of the Lord. But there are other passages. Think of the Sodom and Gomorrah story where Abraham challenges God. If there are only ten just men, would you destroy them? That's almost as if he's saying, God, you're not going to do what's not fitting. So there are hints of a similar kind of rationality in the Jewish Bible. And, of course, in the Christian New Testament with the Gospel of St. John, Logos and God are identified with one another. Which is to say, the foundation is laid for the marriage between Athens and Jerusalem, which is fundamental to the history of the West. And ever since that time, there has been a kind of continuity in that particular. So, for example, Cicero, who was mentioned earlier, uh, and who takes the thinking of Plato and Aristotle, he passes it in Latin to the Latin West. And Cicero, even during the Dark Ages, is not lost. That's one aspect of it. But take self-government. Seems to die out under the Roman Empire, except at the local level, where cities continue to govern themselves with regard to local matters. Uh, in the Dark Ages, and in the period after the Dark Ages, in the medieval period, a principle emerges, taken out of Roman law. Quod omnes tangat ab omnibus tactari debeat. What touches everybody, everybody ought to deal with. It's, a, it's the principle of Roman law concerning corporations that deal with waterways. So the guys upstream don't take all the water from the people downstream. You set up a collegium to govern it. That becomes a principle of canon law to explain why abbots are elected, why canons and cathedrals elected, elect bishops, why the College of Cardinals elects the pope. And it creeps into secular law, municipal law, in all over Europe from canon law to explain why guilds elect their leaders, uh, why communes like Florence and Venice elect their leaders, and finally, why, why parliaments are called. So self-government remains alive. And with it, the principle, things are best sorted out by thinking together by freely discussing things. And of course, the medieval university reflects this as well. We live in a time, however, where this seems to be called into question. Uh, and there's a long history of how we got there. It has something to do with the rejection of metaphysics by, say, for Sir Francis Bacon or David Hume. It's tied up with the notion that reason is the slave of the passions, as suggested by Thomas Hobbes. Uh, but by the 19th century, people are beginning to think that the age of reasoning is over. Think of Matthew Arnold and the stanzas of the Grand on the Grand Chartreuse, which he wrote in 1855. He goes to a monastery on, on, for his honeymoon. I wouldn't recommend this myself, but, but he does, being who he is, Matthew Arnold. And he thinks of the Cistercian order as dying out. And he begins to think that as the tide of faith is going out, so the tide of reason is also going out. You know, the strongest proponents of reason in the 19th century are people like Hegel and Marx. And if you notice, standards change. There is no nature to turn to. There's a kind of historicism. And when Nietzsche comes along, he blows them out of the water. Now, I mention all of this because the discussions the last two days seem to me to be, have, have been discussions about symptoms, not discussions about causes. It isn't an accident that the American university is in trouble. Uh, there isn't an intellectual foundation for the American university anymore. It isn't an accident liberal democracy is in trouble. Who was the last great defender of liberal democracy? Tocqueville. Has there been anyone since Nietzsche of comparable ability. If Sidney Hook were here, he'd say John Dewey, but <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, we have lost f faith in the principle of reason's sufficiency. We live in the age in which Nietzsche's depiction of reason as a snake biting its own tail, and therefore in some sense consuming itself, uh, has come to be very, very powerful. And if you look at the last century, the political movements of the last century are striking for their rejection of reason. 
So for example, fascism, founded by Benito Mussolini. He moves from a kind of rational Marxism by way of reading figures like Nietzsche and reviewing them for the socialist press to a kind of fascism that is built on the rejection of reason and the embrace of radical will. Consider Lenin's Bolshevism. He moves from Marxism, which at least pretends to be a rational doctrine, to a kind of radical voluntarism, rejecting, in fact, the core teaching of Marx. Or look at Hitler. I mean, Hermann Rauschenig in 1938 wrote a book called The Revolution of Nihilism. Uh, he was a German nationalist. He had lots of contact with the Nazis. And he recoiled in horror around 1938, and he wrote this book trying to capture what was going on. All the major political movements of the 20th century have been radically irrational, have been built upon the triumph of the will over everything else. And I'd say progressivism fits into that category as well. Now, we live in a world where you have nihilism on the one hand, multiculturalism, and on the other hand, we have an astonishing moralism the kind of moralism that shuts down discussion in our universities. I, I would say these things too go together. As G.K. Chesterton once said, those who believe in nothing will believe in anything. Um, think about Bowdoin College. I don't know what its motto is, but today its motto ought to be different strokes for different folks. Or, or think about Hamilton College where Robert Paquette teaches. Uh, again, I don't know what its historical motto is, but today its motto should be quid quid, meaning whatever. <laughs> um, what I'm getting at is the people who teach at these institutions and dominate them don't take themselves as having any sort of uh, mission civilatrice. No civilizing mission. It used to be the function of universities to take the rich and turn them into gentlemen uh, by civilizing them and by instructing them in the liberal arts in such a way as to make them thoughtful, capable of using logos in public deliberation, capable of using logos with regard to science and economics and the other fields. The abolition of the general curriculum, the abolition within departments of curricula, turning the college curriculum into a smorgasbord where it doesn't matter what course you take, has to be built on a doctrine. And the doctrine is, it doesn't matter what you learn. Now, if we are to counteract this, it seems to me we have to go back to the foundations of it. And the challenge has to be mounted against the notion that reason is inadequate, that Western civilization is logocentric, and that means racist. In fact, it is logocentric, and that means it is open to all peoples and all ways of thinking, and it is open to criticism, which is to say, one of the things we know is we don't yet fully know. Um, how can this be done? I don't fully know because the challenge is large. In other words, the, the intellectual weight of the last 150 years is against us. There has been no champion of the principle of sufficient reason in the last 150 years who could stand up against a Nietzsche or a Heidegger. But the one thing I think you can appeal to is common sense. Because the absurdity of what's going on at Hamilton College and at Bowdoin College is the sort of thing that the ordinary man in the street, who hasn't been fully corrupted by Nietzsche and Heidegger, can see. But you know, the depth of this is significant. Think of popular music. It's full of existentialism. Think of the Supreme Court decision concerning abortion. It's full of existentialism. Everyone creates his own values. Well, if everyone creates his own values, pushpin is as good as poetry. There is no high, there is no low, there is no right, there is no wrong, but thinking makes it so. That's the doctrine that has to be combated. 
Because if that doctrine is overcome, then the question in colleges and universities will be, what's the best curriculum we could have to provide students with what they really need in order to develop their capacity to think clearly? And that question isn't being asked today. Thank you very much.